The Hispanic community is diverse, influential, and has a growing role to play in our region's future. The Sacramento Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, in partnership with Sacramento State, has just released its first economic report focused on the issues and opportunities facing the Hispanic community. Joining us today to make sense of this report and what its results mean for Sacramento are three leaders. Sacramento State's Rita Gallardo Good, Five Star Bank's Lydia Ramirez, and Hispanic Chamber CEO Kathy Rodriguez Aguirre. Lydia, what's the overall message that this report communicates to all of us about the state of the Hispanic community within our region? Well, thank you for having us, Scott. And we appreciate being here to really talk about the importance of this report. But really what it's communicating is we have opportunity, data through opportunity. And that's really what the fundamental component of this reporting is about, is we've had lots of conversation about the needs and um, issues addressing our Hispanic population. But now we have fundamental data to show there are specific buckets of opportunity that we can really put our um, innovation creation representation through and to really help to prosper the Hispanic community overall. Mm. Kathy, what findings do you think will surprise people the most when they see the numbers in this report? Well, Scott, again, thank you for having us here. I, um, I'm so excited about this report. This is the first hyperlocal report that's been done about the profile here of our Hispanic community. And one of the things we asked Sac State was really one simple question. Can you do this and just show us what the profile is? So just like everyone else, when I got the report, um, there were things in here that I was really surprised about. And one of them actually that stood out was the citizenship. So when you look at this, our 18 and under, 96% are US citizens. And the reason that that stood out to me is oftentimes we see the media and the stories, this narrative that's told about us that now I can say is not the full story. And that was one of the things with this report. Um, you know, Rita and Lydia are both on my board and they've heard me say numerous times that we need to own our story and we need to be in charge of it. And this data allows us to do that, to come out and say, you know what, this is actually what our story is. You know, Kathy, I am so glad you brought up that percentage of young people because that there were many things that jumped out in the report, but that one really jumped out at me because we at the news media, we have been communicating and implying a very different story. Uh, not, not that w regardless of, of where people come from or, or who they are, we welcome all but the fact is, is that the, the language and the perceptions that the that media has created are really in opposition to those numbers you just referenced. Exactly. And you said it best. Like we're welcoming to all. Our community is incredibly diverse. And that's what we want to share, that we are. Uh, we have an immigrant story. That I think everyone shares somewhere through their history. But when we look at what this future is, we're looking at uh, workforce, right, that are already U.S. citizens that are here, and they're our future voters. So it's about time when someone really looks at this and asks themselves, are we telling the right story? How are we reaching out to this community? How are we making sure we're investing in this community? Because this is the workforce. So if we want California to continue to be successful, Sacramento, really the whole United States, we need to start looking at things differently, and we need to be really reaching out in a different way. Rita, I'm curious, how did Sac State get involved in the creation of this report? Well, uh, as as uh, Kathy shared, their uh, priorities really have to do with um, looking at uh, Latino businesses. And there had been a report previously by CSU Long Beach regarding the status of Latinos. And so the idea came about through conversations with the Hispanic Chamber around opportunities to report more than just the um, economic impact, but to talk about education and to talk about home ownership. And obviously, the Institute for Social Research here at Sacramento State was excited about the opportunity to participate because we had seen the impact that it had in Southern California, especially a city that's equal in size to Sacramento, but to also encompass um, the information and data regarding the sixth um, county region. That was exciting to us, and it was something that uh, our uh, administrators 
definitely wanted to be part of. And I'm really grateful for that partnership with the Hispanic Chamber to bring about um, information that can make change, create change. Mm -hmm. Lydia, uh, well, Rita's comments bring up an issue for me that I, I would like you to speak to, and, but everybody's welcome to jump in. So Kathy uses the term Hispanic, and it is the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Rita just used the, the term Latino. I've heard the term Latinx. Mm -hmm. Help us, just as an aside, deal with what is the appropriate um, description that we, we as a community should be using to describe this community? Because it seems that there are a lot of, uh, of different things. Can you help there me? Are. There are. I think a lot of our viewers, <laughs> they, they, they've got the same kind of question that I do. Well, you know what? Frankly, so do we. And, and that's just being honest, right? That's why you just got three different versions of what could it possibly be. I think it's a, uh, it's a personal identification um, in terms of what the individual um, uh, feels comfortable calling themselves representing. Um, if you were to ask what is the most political or correct term to use, it would probably be Latinx today to incorporate all um, that might fit underneath that umbrella, both um, he, she, and they. Um, so that's why we do utilize that term of Latinx to be inclusive in nature, to include all uh, parties that might identify in that regard. But if you were to ask me, I more closely identify with Hispanic or Latino, and that was just um, how I was raised with my family and in the community that I was a part of, which um, why um, the founders of the Sacramento Hispanic Chamber of Commerce named it as such. It was 50 years ago that that term was used. And there was an evolution to Latino um, to more encompass, encompass all of the Latin American uh, cultures that might come underneath that umbrella. Um, so it's it's a ever evolving landscape, so to speak. But um, I think the uh, the more appropriate term at, at this day and age um, for uh, for the media and such would probably be Latinx at this point. Anybody else uh, have a opinion that they want to offer on this? You know, Lydia said it best. I mean, we always, you know, I always let people know whatever you personally feel comfortable with is, it's an individual choice. You know, mm -hmm. when someone asks me, I usually say Latina. And I told someone the other day, if actually possible, I probably would have said Americana because I like to think that, you know, I'm in twist. I was born here and in California. So it is that I feel that would be more me. But it's one of those, just like for everyone else, it's, you know, reflective of you. And I always let people know, just be respectful of what people choose. I always tell the funny story that when I came home from college, my first uh, quarter came home and told my mom and said, I just found out that I am Chicana. I took my first Chicano <laughs> studies class. And I got to tell you, Scott, this is what my mom said. No, no, you're not. <laughs> that is not. And so it's generational too. So it's one of those things that we spend a lot of time on, on it. But again, it's an individual choice. But what we really want to focus on more is, you know, what are the common bonds and the common opportunities that we have and focus there and put our energies there. And hopefully someday, you know, we'll all come to a term that we, uh, you know, that we all can agree on. But for right now, I think that, is just reflective of the diversity of our community. Well said. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, let, let's go so back. No easy to... answer for that one. Okay. <laughs> all right. Hey, you know, we, we, we are all about promoting and growing understanding. So uh, th thank you for the feedback. Uh, let's go back to the report now. Uh, what are some of the conventional assumptions, Rita, that you think that this port report, beyond um, particularly that percentage of young people who are U.S. citizens that um, we just talked about, what do you think that this report most blows up in terms of conventional wisdom about the community? Well, I think that um, it shares that the Latino community has come along um, much more than, um, say, the media has given us credit for, whether it was internet in the home, uh, whether it was um, education attainment. Uh, I found that um, uh, the numbers showed that we have acclimated um, 
being here in this country, um, as my, my parents, my, my father uh, came in 1961 from Guadalajara, and uh, uh, my father has a fifth grade education. I'm in a doctorate program. My father came here so that I would um, come here and work hard and, and grow and prosper. And all that, all that being said, what I was very um, proud about was that uh, at this time, the Latinos in this region have uh, five percent of those Latinos have a graduate degree. That shows that we're starting to grow in this um, region to have. Um, uh, have acclimated ourselves um, to give back to the community, to help run businesses. Um, I was really very proud to see that um, the numbers aren't as dire, but there's still um, numbers that were surprising to me, especially when it came to the impact of COVID. Well, I, one, you know, it's great that you mentioned that, Rita, because I, I want to uh, go to Kathy. And Kathy, one of the things that really jumped out at me in this report was that from a income level, in Sacramento County, that the community earns the the uh, average wage that was reported or family household income was eighty five thousand dollars, and that's higher than the general income within the community. Now, I, I assume that that was for based on uh, a family, you know, so um, you know, a family size of three or four or something like that. I don't know what the statistician Jews, but I thought that, wow, if, if I were in business marketing products and services, I'd say, man, this is a community that if I haven't captured a market share, I really need to be looking at this community as an opportunity. And, and you're completely right, Scott. I would say, though, one of the things that, you know, this was our, our first report. So this is the baseline. And that actually, you know, was brought up a few times, you know, this part and the fact that there is actually this closing of a gap um, in income. In our community, one of the things that, you know, would probably be show up in the next report is we also tend to be multi-generational households. So it's not uncommon, you know, for there to be a family and maybe um, the grandparents are still there or, you know, um, the daughters moved in and sat and they're taking care of one another. And so that in a sense will, you know, inflate the income there, mm. but it's still to say that you are right though. It's a market share that you want to look at because what happens is that they're making decisions together, right. Or coming in together, you know, to purchase a home and Lydia, who's, you know, a leader in the banking industry can certainly speak, you know, to that from her. And, but there, there's a lot going on. And I think one of the important parts from this report is that, to realize the Hispanic community has been contributing to the economic engine of this region. The Latino community is either, you know, it's a predominant workforce, they're opening businesses, they're, you know, purchasing new homes, all through even the horrible impact of COVID. So as we lost more lives in the Latino community, and that's a fact, you know, it's there. There was also this other part where this resiliency of coming together and continuing to make sure that, you know, you were thriving through recovery. And so it's an interesting, you know, piece, and maybe that's where that, you know, spirit comes in that we all have in our stories of someone that gave up everything to come here to create these options, you know, for us as Rita spoke to. But, you know, it's definitely something that people need, you know, to look at. This is a market share that you don't want to overlook because, you know, because of the growth, because of the investments that it's making. And yes, if you are a company, I would certainly be looking through this report and rethinking how am I messaging out to make sure one, yes, to help this community, but two, let's be honest, it's going to help your bottom line. Right, right. Lydia, <clears throat> as a banker, I, I wanted to ask you, what are the implications of some of the findings in there, such as that only a third of Hispanic high school graduates met the requirements to enter university at the CS and UC level. It, you're about uh, helping to grow the region right. at, um, as a banker and, and funding those entrepreneurial opportunities to grow our future economy. But the workers are the most uh, important resource to getting that done. How did you react to that? So that's very uh, interesting that you bring up that topic, Scott. To me, that was probably one of the more aha moments for me as I was reading that report. Um, because, so you start out with the population number that was um, astounding to many people, thinking that um, those under the, the age of 18 
uh, that number that were actually uh, truly 100% American citizens um, was pretty, is, was high. So if you're thinking about that number, and then you're looking at the educational attainment and um, the opportunities afforded to them at high school um, and not being given the same opportunities or not giving the same communication, um, there's, an, there's an opportunity there. There's an opportunity to create, um, to, to remove the divide or the unequal divide to make sure that everyone has access to understand what are the requirements for a CSU so that we can go into Sac State? What are the requirements for a UC so we can go into the UC system? I was a, a UC Davis grad and, and Kathy was a UC Davis grad. Um, and so, you know, trying to figure what does that look like? Um, uh, Rita talked about 5% uh, get their uh, graduate degrees. I'm part of that 5%. Rita's going to be a part of the 1% that get their PhD. So um, while the numbers show that people are doing it, it's still too small and we need to create representation. And one of the things that Kathy and I talk about constantly is uh, representation matters. And so when I'm thinking about my position within the the banking industry and um, being um, the chief operations officer for Five Star Bank and being a part of that C-suite and Kathy representing the chamber as a CEO, there's not enough, there's not enough uh, um, Latinas or Latinos or Latinx individuals at the executive director and above C-suite individuals. Um, we need to start opening up those doors and inviting those. So as I go up, I need to bring five more people up with me that are willing and wanting to be able to do that. So how does Five Star Bank come into that whole play? We are, to your point, participate in the entrepreneurial programs through Sac State or with UC Davis, um, with UOP. But now the next stage is to make sure we go down deeper through the Los Rios group. And then um, even into, we do a lot with Cristo Ray um, and making sure that we have a fundamental understanding of, we understand that there's a large population coming through our education system right now. And it would be foolish for us to not pay attention to the workforce development that needs to happen at all levels and starting down at the K through 12 grades in order to be able to create that equal educational attainment and to move our um, population from the skilled workers into education or healthcare or management. Well, I, um, I, I hear you on that. And in one of the profiles, Kathy, uh, Cambria Solution CEO, Robert Rodriguez, you know, you hear about a success story of an entrepreneur like that who's grown a very large, very successful and, and thriving company. But then you connect that back to some of the other stories that you have in here, like Jonathan Hernandez's. And the it, it seems that there is a, a need somehow to further elevate and highlight those success stories, because I think all of us can agree that when you see someone you can relate to on, on whatever basis, it can give a young person the inspiration and the belief to kind of reach for their own star. How do we do more of that? Oh my gosh, Scott. So I think you're looking at three people here that love nothing more than to do just that. Mm -hmm. So it is about, you know, elevating one another, you know, sharing our stories. The reason you see the mix in here is exactly for what you said. We wanted a student profile so people can see, you know, what their journey is and what it's looking like. And then Robert's in there who, ha you know, started with very humble beginnings and has created, you know, this big company. And if you talk to him, he's very much the same way. It's about bringing people up with them and making sure there's representation at all levels of his management and executive you know, team. So it's being intentional about what you're doing and who you're bringing up and then and sharing that with everyone. So people have heard me say numerous times, there's enough light for everyone. And it's our job to make sure that we're casting it out. When we talk about you know, interns and mentoring, like, uh, we take it very seriously. Right. You know, we're there to make sure that whether they need an email, a call, whatever that might be, we're available. And we need to talk about that openly, you know, both the struggles and the challenges, but the successes, you know, with our younger generation. So they know that it's it's possible. It's attainable. Well, well, well Kathy, as a matter of fact, um, recently along those lines to try and build those connections, didn't you in the chamber also start your own leadership program to try and and start to build that out? Absolutely. Well, so we're one of the ones, just as you were, that came in to help brainstorm, you know, for a new um, leadership program that is, you know, focused on Latino leadership. And it's called Nueva Epica. 
And right now it's being um, run through a team of community leaders. And I know that Rita is one of the mentors for it. So there's a lot, actually what's really great about it is it's brought a lot of the community together you know, to do that. So they first, just graduated the first cohort and they're going through their second right now. And it was exactly that, to bring in emerging leaders, um, to give them that opportunity to bond and connect with one another, to find out you know, you're, not, you're not the only one. A lot of times we think people are coming through and think I'm the only one that's feeling this. I'm the only one that's experiencing this. You know the power of bringing people together and hearing from one another saying, okay, you understand what it's like to be the, you know, the only woman, the only Latina, the only something right. in a group. And suddenly when you're with a group that the only becomes bigger. And right. so we're, you know, helping to establish that next group of leaders to give them that confidence to continue to build up and elevate, but also that reminder that as you're going up, that you're bringing people with you. Right. Rita, I, I want to go back to this report and, and frankly, the times that, it was created within. We, we've talked a lot about tangentially the coronavirus and all of its various impacts, but how specifically, you know, given this report and, and some of the opportunities and challenges that it highlights, how has the coronavirus impacted some of the things that Sac State studied with regards to the Hispanic community? Well, I'd like to say that I'm very proud of the leadership of President Nelson. Uh, we continue to support students through this pandemic. Um, we were um, quick to pivot to an online uh, virtual environment and we're quick to provide uh, mental health services, um, food services, any critical services that students needed in order to be successful, including um, converting one of our parking lots um, that is in the entrance of the university into a, a Wi-Fi hotspot. Uh, we ensured that students had what they needed and to include um, the support of faculties for their own success. Uh, I will say that uh, I do wanna share that we are a Hispanic serving institute um, meaning that Sac State serves over 37% of their um, student population um, are Latino. Uh, this past year, uh, our, our uh, admissions were at uh, record-breaking 31,750. Uh, and I share that because we are very um, aware of student success programs and servicing students. And so when it came to the pandemic, we were quick to have the testing, we were quick to bring uh, any um, uh, vaccination services to campus. And I will share that uh, a faculty were, th were there at the table ensuring that they were flexible and working with students for their own success. In uh, May of this past year, uh, we hit 26% graduation rate, 26% of our students came through and completed their um, bachelor degrees in four years. Mm. That is also a testament to the work that Sac State does, um, not only for the Latino students, but also for all the students um, in the region that are, are um, enrolled at Sac State. And finally, Lydia, with all of the findings that were within this report, share with us just in our final moments uh, one thing that you'd like to see future study and, and more focus on as you look toward preparing more reports like this in the future? That's a great question, Scott. I think this, um, this report is scratching the surface and giving us an opportunity to have a starting point uh, to bring people to the table and have the conversations that are going to be meaningful for opportunity going forward. But the next iteration uh, will probably focus on home ownership. Uh, we've focused a lot about on renter um, numbers in this report, but home ownership is going to be that next, um, you know, um, focus uh, for opportunity to pay attention to, you know, how do we get um, the American dream and how do we help to uh, achieve that together as a community and what are, um, who needs to be at the table to assist with that. But, but first we need the true data to see where we are with that component um, and how our tax dollars are being used as a community. Um, are they going back to the reinvestment into the community or maybe doing something different? And how can we help to um, maybe move that funding so that it's, it's being um, allocated appropriately so we see this population thriving within the Sacramento region? And I think that we'll leave it there. We'll look forward to that next report. And that's our show. Thanks to our guests and thanks to you for watching Studio Sacramento. 
I'm Scott Syfax. See you next time right here on KVIE. Episodes of Studio Sacramento, along with other KVIE programs, are available to watch online at kvie.org/video.